Today on an all new Dr. Phil. She went from top model to rock bottom. My sister is drinking herself to death. You're living in squalor. These are all my throw up bags. An alcoholic. This is her taking a nap in a flower bed. Living with her dad. Look at how you're allowing your child to live. How can we expect her to stop drinking in that environment? Do you think you're part of the problem or part of the solution? Definitely part of the solution. And giving her alcohol is the solution? I gave her watered down vodka. She's died twice under your care. He's bringing you pink slippers and ice cream. You are making it able for her to kill herself. Let's do it. Not a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. here today and she was once a stunning model who traveled the world. She dated pro athletes, posed for top photographers and graced the covers of high-end fashion magazines. But her younger sister Carrie emailed me because Amanda has gone from top model to this. Full-blown alcoholic. Don't take a picture of me. Amanda's family says she is drunk from morning to night, has already died twice from heart failure, and now has a permanent pacemaker. Now, to top it all off, she lives in a house full of trash with her father, Steve, who Carrie calls a hoarder. Now, Carrie claims Steve enables Amanda and wants me to give her father a wake-up call before Amanda dies one last time. My sister is drinking herself to death. Amanda's addiction is so bad that if she doesn't stop drinking, she's probably going to die. In high school, my sister was America's sweetheart. She got good grades, just a really good kid. Amanda was very stunning. From a very young age, I noticed that people noticed her when she walked into a room. She always dreamed of becoming a model. I was not surprised that Amanda was successful modeling. Her modeling had gone from doing pictures to club promotion, just a very party lifestyle. Back in 2011, Amanda had moved to be with her then fiance. He passed away in Afghanistan. She went over the edge, was absolutely wasted every night and continued to drink like that up until today. Three years later, she was being rushed to the hospital. She was going through withdrawal symptoms. She was hallucinating. Things were spiraling out of control. It got to the point that she could not care for herself. But she did reluctantly come back and agree to stay with me. One night, about 3 in the morning, I came down the stairs, and I found Amanda laying right here and jerking back and forth. And her tongue was sticking out of her mouth. Her cheeks were swollen, and as she jerked, she made this moaning noise, and she was just making a ah, ah. I called 911. By the time I had gotten to the hospital, she was already hooked to the ventilator. All of a sudden, the monitor went blank. The alarms came on. Her heart had stopped. They resuscitated her. I was hopeful because I thought, she's finally hit rock bottom. This is going to be her wake up call. She didn't stop drinking. It's gotten worse. And so here we are, and she's 31 years old, and she has a pacemaker defibrillator because she can't stop drinking. If my sister doesn't get help, I know that we will be planning her funeral. It's not being melodramatic to say she's died twice. I mean, her heart has literally stopped, and not just a few beats. They've had to resuscitate her, revive her, and bring her back, and she's been gone for dangerous periods of time, and you think if this happens again, that's it? Absolutely. There's no doubt in your mind, right? No doubt Either in one my of mind. you. No. Does your father get how imminent this danger is? I think to a certain degree he does. It's only gotten worse since, you know, she's been living with him. Mm -hmm. He 
He just acts as if the situation just is, has become the norm. Instead of moving beyond it, it's become a normal lifestyle for the two of them. This isn't a close call here. This girl's died twice. She is living with a pacemaker because her heart's going to shut down. And the conditions in which she's living are disgusting. This is not a close call. My point is, for him to not see this is not just like, eh, it's a matter of opinion. This one isn't a close call. What's going on that's distorting his reality this much? That's the number one question that we would like an answer to, is why isn't he doing anything about Have this? Have you asked that question? Yeah, yes, she has especially. Why is he doing what he's doing, which is providing her a home, giving her money, buying her alcohol, continuing to make it possible for her to do what she's doing? Yes, you're looking at her like you don't know this? That he's driving her to the liquor store? That is news to me. No, I did not know that. If she doesn't do something from this point <clears throat> on, she will be dead. And I'm not going to allow that to happen. Well, Amanda actually gave us a tour of her room. And beware what you're about to see up close, because it just may make you nauseous. Take a look. You're looking at my destroyed room. This is from a lot of drunken nights. These are all my shoes. These are all of my clothes, my bed. This is all the medicine from the ER. This one's Ambien, Gabin Pitten. This one's a diuretic for my heart. A antidepressant, Zofran, Metropropyrol. It's for my heart. These are all my throw up bags for when I get sick, <laughs> like that. These are all bottle caps from the little mini bottles. I've got a few bags. I feel really embarrassed because you're seeing it. Makeup, bunch of beauty stuff. These are clothes. And then this one's my junk drawer. This is me getting intoxicated and just not giving a crap. This has gotten this way because of my drinking. And I was actually clean a few months ago. I went on a bender, and this is what became of it. Now, Carrie thinks the only way for Amanda to get better is for me to fix the father. And I do not disagree with that. He, he is not here because he's not one of these two. He's not of the same attitude. Amanda is living at my dad's house. It's a very unhappy, toxic place. The house gets cluttered, but I don't think it's a disaster zone. Her father's house is one step below a homeless encampment. If I found out that my dad was giving my sister alcohol, I would be absolutely livid. I did give her some watered down alcohol. And later, you bought her alcohol at Costco, big bottles. It's, it's cheaper, right? But I, I poured half of it out and put water in, in it. I would freeze the bottles so the water would freeze and then it would be pure alcohol. Amanda is living at my dad's house. I think it's a very unhappy, toxic place. I don't think it's a toxic environment at all. Her father's house is one step below a homeless encampment. It looks that bad. This room I don't think is that bad. I don't think the bathroom's bad. How many years has his house looked like that now? Since I left in 1999. The house gets cluttered, but I don't think it's a disaster zone, as some people might have said. My dad is very delusional when it comes to my sister drinking. Steve has just gotten so fed up with Amanda and has the attitude that if she's gonna drink, she's gonna drink and there's nothing he can do to stop her. If I found out that my dad was giving my sister alcohol, I would be absolutely livid. There was a time to help her with her withdrawals that I did give her some watered down alcohol, uh, thinking that was a strategy that might help her. It didn't help her. Another strategy was just to give her uh, enough alcohol so that she would not go into withdrawals. However, I discovered that didn't work as well. As long as Amanda stays in that house with him, I don't think the cycle of drinking will end. We've had discussions about her drinking, and I've told her, why do you drink so much? Why don't you just drink a little bit to feel good? It would be in my sister's best interest to no longer live at my dad's house. Steve, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Do you think you're part of the problem or part of the solution? 
I'm the one that found her in, in a seizure state, called 911. No one else was there doing that, so I feel that I'm um, definitely part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And giving her alcohol is the solution? Yes, I gave, gave her water down vodka because her cardiologist said either drink or don't drink. Stop going through withdrawals because it's going to kill you. I think you're part of the problem. I think you're also part of the solution. Nobody's all one way or the other. Um, here's what I know for sure. I, I, I believe this to be true. You have the best intentions. I'm a dad. Yeah. You know, we have two, we have two boys. And... You know, they're close in age to, to your daughter here. And I, I've, you know, th these are my two boys. And if, if one of them was in the situation, it's a lot easier for me to say do it than for you to do it because you're close to your daughter, and, which is why it's good to talk to somebody that's objective. Mm -hmm. We all hear the term enable, but do you ever really stop and think what that means? Take a look. I, I've written it down. It's to make something possible, practical or easy for someone to do or be. It often perpetuates a problem. So it's not that you're assisting. It's not like, here, let me pour you a drink. But it's that you make it possible or practical or easy. It's also creating a safe environment where if she left home, she's in other people's houses, she's completely drunk, they have opportunity to take advantage of her. How, her how's that working for you? Well. Uh, she's not dead, so it, in that respect, it's currently. Good. currently. She's died twice under your care, and you say you, uh, you say that you've been dealing with okay. this for three years. She's been drinking three? for seven. Who let's, was? Let's back up and don't talk about. Don't interrupt me. Don't sit here and make it sound like it's just been you taking care of her this whole entire time. It pretty because much who has met, just been because, me. Because yeah, oh, you giving her alcohol and living in a pigsty. That uh, small amount that's, of time out of that safe. three years. Living in that environment for, is safe. For, this is so not a foot race about who did best or who did worse or whatever. I, you guys can work that out on your own. I'm asking you if you can acknowledge that what you're doing is not working. Because if you're here to defend what you're doing, we're going to have a very different conversation than if you're here to change what you're doing. I'm here to change what I'm doing. If, there's, if you show me a better way, I'm willing to listen and do it. Let's, let's take a look at drunk Amanda. What's she doing here? Vomiting. And that's because she's, she's alcohol sick, right? Yeah, she's going, starting to go through withdrawals. Yeah, she's sick. This is so toxic. Uh, what is here, just napping? I don't know, I don't know that picture. I'm not sure where that yeah, one came well, from. Well, she's out. This is her taking a nap in a flower bed. Yeah. OK. And this, by the way, is a cast. She broke her foot from being drunk. Now, let's look at the conditions in which you guys are living. Now, tell me under what theory this is any kind of okay. I wouldn't say that it is, no. Is that your idea of keeping her safe? And mind you, this is the living room that Amanda lives in. The bedrooms upstairs are so full of stuff that she has to live downstairs yeah. in the living room. That's not why she lives down there. We, we were not permitted to go upstairs. Yeah, you were. I, I gave permission to go up there. Well, and I think the reason why she wanted to live downstairs is because it's easier for her to drink. I, for one, am glad she's not living upstairs because that means she can't fall downstairs. Yeah. Seriously. That's true. Uh, you, you can't fall off the floor, so if you stay downstairs, then at least you can't fall off the floor. So, I mean, come on. This is sick. It is bad, I know. This, this is sick. You, you, you got to own it. Yeah. You got to own it. And this is what I call enabling. If you're allowing someone, if you're either maintaining, eliciting, or allowing someone to live in this way, then that is enabling. And until you are willing to say, this is not okay, and I, I recognize that this absolutely, unequivocally, has to change dramatically, then there's not a chance. N nothing I do is, is going to have an impact on her, because if she can return to this squalor and, and pass out on this bed in here, then 
she's got an exit ramp that, that she can take no matter what I do. So I have to know that you're willing to go back, bulldoze all that stuff out of there, rip that carpet out of there, change the locks, and tell her you cannot live here. We're going to take a break, and you need to think about that. When Amanda ended up in the hospital after nearly drinking herself to death, she got ice cream, hamburgers, pink slippers, and spa robes. Find out why the family says that Steve is treating her like a little princess when she's in this kind of a meltdown, in this kind of a process. We'll be right back. My dad treats my sister like a little girl when she's in the hospital. Don't bring her ice cream. Don't make it like it's a day spa. I'm just disgusted by it, truthfully. And later... You look at that list and you think, oh, geez, no wonder she drinks. Sometimes she exaggerates the story. I think it's an absolute insult to trivialize any of those things. When Amanda was in the hospital, Steve would treat her like a 12-year-old instead of a 31-year-old woman. He went out and bought her a little pink strawberry shortcake blanket. To me, that's a little strange. My dad treats my sister like a little girl when she's in the hospital. He just babies her. Don't make her hospital visit more comfortable so that she keeps going back. Don't bring her ice cream. Don't make it like it's a day spa. I'm just disgusted by it, truthfully. I think my dad needs to be a lot tougher on my sister and not even visit her in the hospital anymore. Now, I would have loved to have had her out here 20 minutes ago. But do you understand why I, I, I haven't called her out here yet? Mm -hmm. Because there's no point in me talking to her if I've got you lurking in the background saying, I got you, baby. If that's your position, I can't help you. I have to send you guys home. Because I think you are what's making it able for her to continue to kill herself. It's her choice, not yours. She's doing it, not you. She owns it, you don't but you're her failsafe. You're her exit ramp. When she is there and she's drinking, you don't even realize that she's drunk. Half of the time that you think that she's sober. You can't she's trust yourself is what she's saying. You've become blind to it. This is TJ. He's here from, from Origins. And uh, they flew in here today from Padre Island. It's Origins Behavioral Health Care. It's the nation's, in my opinion, the nation's leading dual diagnosis treatment center. And I, I am prepared to offer that. But TJ, there's no point in doing that if, if, because look, there's a first week letter that comes out of treatment, right? Husband, mom, dad, you got to come get me. This place is worse than the rest of the world. There's more drugs and alcohol here than there is on the street. I can write the letter. You should just print them out. They write the same letter, and one thing that you can't have is a family that's going to buy into that and come rescue. And, and that's what happens when the family's not aligned. But you're going to get that letter, and you're going to believe it. No, I won't. Yes, you will. You've been so <clears throat> oblivious to everything that's been going on, Steve. When we, uh, Carrie and Stephen, our son, for months, months, we told you Amanda was doing drugs. No, she's not. No, she's not. For months, we told you she was doing drugs. She tested positive for heroin in the hospital when, that, when she went into cardiac arrest. You, you forget the contrast because for years from like, what, 17 to 25 or whatever, she was very successful, right? She was out, she was modeling, she was traveling, she was doing great things for that period of time, right? And compare that to now. Look at the difference. It's not even the same person. And maybe it was subtle, maybe you didn't know it at the time, but it's pretty dramatic, don't you think? Mm -hmm. That's the reason I know I came to bear my soul to try to help Manda. <clears throat> okay, but look at the house, look at how you're allowing your child to live. He, that is not okay. He doesn't see it as a problem. He just told me that he doesn't understand how his house and the living conditions, how that ha what that has to do with my sister and her. I mean, do problem. you really not think that this is a problem? I think that it needs to be cleaned up. It is a problem, but what I was trying to tell Carrie is 
that if every alcoholic in the world, all they needed was a clean place and they wouldn't drink, that... That's not the point. This is pathological. This is pathological. If you believe this is pathological, stand up. Just a quick focus group, straw poll. I, I understand that. And I agree with you. Well, then stop defending it. I'm not defending necessarily. I'm just clarifying like I tried to do before, but I won't do it we, anymore. How can we expect her to stop drinking in that environment when it makes me want to drink? It's disgusting and it's miserable. Do you think she wants to get clean and sober living in that environment? She has no job. She has no... She has. A bu she has a high school education at a minimum. She has <clears throat> nothing to live for other than alcohol at this point. Do you, would you want to get clean and sober if you were living in that environment? If you're not 100% willing, I would rather excuse you and do this without you. I'm 100% willing. I, I wouldn't be here otherwise. Okay. We're going to meet Amanda uh, after the break. She was just released from the hospital last week and said she would stay sober until she met me. Well, did she? Uh, we'll find out when we come back. I wish I could be one of the people who goes out and has a glass of wine with dinner. One drink turns into 10 drinks. Closed captioning provided by Amanda was once a gorgeous model gracing the covers of high-end fashion magazines, but now, well, now she's just a falling down drunk whose heart has stopped twice. Now she has a permanent pacemaker. So how did she go from top model to rock bottom? Take a look. I became an alcoholic the day that my fiance passed away. From that moment on, I've been drinking almost every day. A bottle of wine, and then it progressed to two bottles of wine, and then hard alcohol. It was always the little mini shots. A couple years after my fiance died, I met somebody and got married. I started drinking more heavily, and we got divorced, and that's when my drinking really got bad. I would wake up and take a shot, and then I would walk to the liquor store. I didn't realize at that point that it was affecting my health. I don't remember, but in 2015, I went into cardiac arrest. A year later, they put a pacemaker in because I was going through withdrawals. My heart was beating at like 12 beats per minute. Here's my defibrillator card. I got it July 27th, 2016. They told me don't drink, but I started drinking again like an idiot. I wish I could be one of the people who goes out and has a glass of wine with dinner. One drink turns into 10 drinks. It doesn't just stop at one. Have you been drinking today? No. When was the last time you had a drink? Yesterday. And how much did you drink yesterday? One drink. Uh, and were you starting to go into withdrawal? No. Uh, why'd you have a drink if you weren't going into withdrawal? Um, because of nerves. Uh, what was making you nervous? Coming on the show. Uh -huh. What's this con you got going on with your dad? Con? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, you've got him providing you a home. You've got him thinking that it's okay to live like that. He's allowing you to continue to be a drunk in the home. How did you pull that off? I honestly think that he just doesn't know what to do with me. Try to stay, um, you know, at friends' houses and away a you lot. You died twice. You, you, you're living in squalor. You guys have defined a relationship here that enables you to continue doing what you're doing. You go to the hospital uh, and because of alcohol toxicity, so much so that your heart stops, and he's bringing you pink slippers and ice cream. How, how did you work this out? I'm really asking, I'm curious. 
I have no idea. <laughs> you kind of count on it, don't you? I do, yes. It's kind of always been that way, though. Like, you've always been kind of a daddy's girl. Uh, You're in L.A., and things are expensive in L.A. What did that drink cost yesterday? It cost $13. Yeah. That's shocking people in Omaha right now. <laughs> uh, where'd you get the 13 bucks? Pay for a credit card, cash? What? I put it on the room. You, you put it on our room? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> How'd she pay for it? I don't know. I don't know. I didn't even know that she had gotten a drink. Yeah. Oblivious. You, you like told the producers together. you put it on your dad's credit card. No. Credit card on file at the hotel. Maybe it went on the credit card. And... Yeah. Because they won't charge alcohol to the room. We don't pay for alcohol. Particularly for you. Of course. <laughs> really? Well, there's a block on there, so... So, how'd you get his credit card? Um, he put it down for the room, put it down for his room as well. Yeah. Which we pay for, so you put it down to do other stuff, and she charged alcohol to it. Apparently. Well, first time hearing of it. Wow. <laughs> uh, Amanda says seven months ago, her dad bought her big bottles of vodka from Costco. Uh, a month ago, her dad drove her to get alcohol. True? I didn't pay for the alcohol, but I gave her a ride because I know I shouldn't have. You, you bought her alcohol at Costco? That was quite a while ago. Seven but, months ago? Yeah, something like that. Big bottles? It was, it's cheaper, right? But I, I poured half of it out and put water in half in it. So, I found out that he watered it down so I would freeze the bottles so the water would freeze and then it would be pure alcohol. <laughs> Coming up, Steve says Amanda goes missing for days and turns off her phone. Well, so where does she go? Uh, she'll tell us when we come back. My dad is a trigger for me. He treats me like I'm 17 sometimes. When I'm talking on the phone, he'll mute the TV so he can hear my phone conversations. There are times that she leaves and she doesn't tell me where she goes. I'm old enough to where if I want to stay out with friends, I should be able to. The last time that I was in detox, my dad went through my room and he found the bottles of alcohol that I had and threw them away. He should stay out of my room and stop digging through my stuff. Closed captioning provided by... There was a time that my dad was supposed to be watching my son and he had left to go to the gym. And when I got back, I discovered that my sister had taken my son somewhere and she had clearly been drinking. Drunk driving with my son is absolutely not okay. My sister and my son were very close when he was younger. She was his favorite person. Now he's kind of scared to be around her. Well, Carrie says that her sister Amanda is a severe alcoholic and I don't think anybody really disputes that at this point. Her self-destructive lifestyle took her from the covers of top fashion magazines to really living in squalor uh, in her father's house. Now, Amanda says since she doesn't have a relationship with her mother, she has no choice but to live with her father, Steve, who she says is oblivious to her drinking much of the time or just doesn't choose to dial into it. And, um, you know, Amanda, I, I've said many times, nobody starts drinking to become an alcoholic, right? No drug addict starts doing drugs to become an addict. And I've put together some of the things that have happened because you had a lot of traumatic events in your life, right? Yes. Your mom left the home when you were 12. That was upsetting to you. You said your best friend died when you were 19. You said you were sexually assaulted some years later when you were 24. 
and that's never really been resolved in you. That leaves a terrible scar. It was about then that your modeling career came to an end. Yeah, I decided to retire. Mm -hmm. And you were engaged, and your fiancé died, right? He passed away in Afghanistan. He was a yeah. Marine. He was deployed? Yes. And he was killed in Afghanistan? Yes. But then you pulled things together, and you found another relationship with a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he took his own life. Next to me while I was sleeping. Yeah. And you were in bed together? Um, I was in the chair next to him. Uh-huh. In the lazy Amanda. chair. When I talked to the police officers that night, they told me that you were in the living room when it happened and he was alone in the bedroom. He shot himself at the computer right next to me. That's not what the police officers told me that okay, night. Okay, well, there's a bullet hole in the wall right next to the computer. Uh, is this That's significant right in some way? I, I, well, to, I, I think he was in the same exact room right next to me. I think it's significant in a way that I do feel like my sister has a tendency to kind of exaggerate a story a little bit to kind of, um, I don't know, <laughs> maybe to victimize herself a little bit more. I was right next to him. I don't want to dispute the fact that these things happen and that she's hurt about it, but I, I do feel like in order for her to ever recover from it, she has to look at it from a very honest perspective. You've never woken up to a gunshot and looked over and saw blood all over the wall. I understand that. And a that, hole but in the wall and someone I guess the, toppled what over. I'm disputing is that I don't think that he was technically your boyfriend. And so it's little things like that that kind of try to like that make the story a little bit more. And you had broken up with your fiance, so he really wasn't your fiance at the time you passed away. You had already broken up with him. It's just little discrepancies in, way, in the story. Somebody's blowing their brains out right next to you. No matter if it's a stranger, it's going to affect you. That's, I understand that's not that, a, that's not but, a, but, <laughs> but that's, that's not my issue. It's it's more about I feel like in order to, to in order to fully recover from it, I just feel like. It has to come from a very honest place because you look at that list and you think, oh, well, geez, no wonder she drinks, you know? But that doesn't get down to the very root of those problems. Well, you don't think that I loved him still? I'm not and disputing that. We were that. Resolving I'm things? not disputing that at all. I do. I, believe I absolutely that. Yeah. loved him. I'm, 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 I'm not denying that. Well, you know, I don't know whether he was in the chair next to her or whether he was a casual acquaintance or whether he wasn't, but I think it's an absolute insult to trivialize any of those things. Um, That's not my goal I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but I, I think it's a I think it's an insult to trivialize any of those things, I whether do too. it's your mother leaving or whatever. I don't know what you're talking about. So you apparently have some insight I don't have. So what? Why is she drinking then? Inside I don't have. So what? Why is she drinking then? Sometimes she exaggerates the story. Oh, you have some alternative theory of why she's drinking. What is it? That's the gist of it. So I, I'm well, not. So what is it you're disputing then? I'm not disputing the the list, and I'm not disputing Actually, that those are, things Actually, you are. So you have her. some alternative theory. What is it? My just my concern is that if she does address these issues and get help for them, that you have an alternative theory. If this list is invalid, then what is your theory of why she's drinking, or are you just wanting to argue? She's drinking because she chooses to. I'm drinking because I'm numbing a lot of pain. Yeah, Mom. I feel like that she's drinking because of this list. I'm not disputing that. Okay, so really you had nothing to add. You just wanted to argue with your sister? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I mean, well, you wanted to interrupt me talking to her to figure things out, so I figured you had some real revelation. It's just my, my concern is that you know, that these might not get resolved if she's not completely honest about the I stories behind I was wearing an that. engagement ring, okay. Carrie, the day that he passed okay. away. Y'all can argue without me being here. I, you have a point. So if this is not contributing to her drinking, I'm just asking, what is your theory? I just, my theory is, is that sometimes this doesn't get resolved because it's not... Because she's not truthful about Tr the situation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Is she truthful about you leaving when you was, when she was twelve? Yeah, I did. I was gone for two years because I went to school. I went to. No, that was I five years. 
It didn't take me five years you to graduate. You were gone for five years. No, he was and not. I, and I raised him for five years. You left him downstairs okay. and threw fast food at him every day you while you went upstairs can, and jerked off I, on your computer. I still didn't tell, leave. Can, can I, I point there. something out to you guys? Have you ever heard the word deflection? <laughs> Alcoholics and addicts are happy to talk about anything except them. So if they can get people arguing among themselves or talking about irrelevant details or any other crap where the focus is not on them, that's a home run. So we're here apparently to try and work with and save her life and y'all want to debate where the guy was sitting when he blew his brains out? whether he was four feet away or eight feet away, you want to debate whether you were gone for two years or 30 months or whatever, you really want to spend your time talking about that? No. Seriously? <laughs> I'm, I'm stunned. Okay, Michelle says Amanda has been kicked out of rehab two times for not following the rules. So is she ready to face this? Is she ready to make the change? Well, we're going to talk about that when we come back. Closed captioning provided by... Uh, before you got out here, I, I said I, I brought some folks here uh, from Origins Behavioral Health Care. And this is T.J. Howard uh, from Origins Behavioral Health Care. Uh, which I, I think is the nation's leading dual diagnosis treatment center. And I, I, I've asked them to be here because I think you're going to be dead soon if you don't do something dramatic. This is a program that is dual diagnosis. They work to criteria. They don't do it for a week or a month. They do it until... They do it until. And when I say until, it may mean that you never return to your hometown. It may mean that you go in a whole different route in your life, but you have one. And TJ, this is a dramatic situation. Oh, yes, sir. It's, it's multidimensional. She's got trauma, alcoholism, family system struggles. You're going to have to deal, deal with all of it, and we're going to have to help you reset or disrupt how you deal with emotional distress because right now all you know is, is to drink this is a this is a serious commitment and i'm offering this to you and to this family because i think you're at the precipice i think you've got to do this or i would not be surprised to read your obituary in the next several months. And I want to know that if I offer this to you, that you will lean into this and you will do this with a hundred percent commitment. Of course. Will you do this? Of course. Absolutely. Do you? Okay. And you are changing the lock. She cannot come back there. You agree with that, correct? Yes, I agree to it. Ser I'm serious. Right? Yes. You, you, you realize you've got to shut that off. And you hear that. He's made that commitment here on tape. I got a record. <laughs> I think this is the right thing to do. I want to thank all of my guests today, especially T.J. Howard and uh, Origins Behavioral Health Care. Uh, we'll keep you guys apprised of what goes on here. We'll see you next time.